As you're sitting, listen to Matthew's gospel. We've been studying Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, Listen to how Matthew interprets Isaiah chapter 9, the passage we've been looking at all of Advent. Isaiah chapter, this is Matthew chapter 4, verse 14. This was, now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew, that is Jesus, withdrew to Galilee. Then leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in a region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, people were sitting in darkness, saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land in the shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew tells us, I didn't just decide, oh, Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 9. I didn't just come up with that. Matthew tells us in his gospel, Jesus went to this land to fulfill this prophecy, the one we've been studying for the last four weeks. We've been looking in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, at the names of God, the names of God, a wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. And we've been looking at what do those four names tell us about the Messiah. The Messiah in Matthew chapter 4 is Jesus, specifically tells us. Let me read to you at the beginning of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. There will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt, but later he shall make it glorious by way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, the Galilee of Gentiles. Then verse 2, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light, and those who live in a dark land, light will shine on them. Those are the first two verses of chapter 9, which Matthew takes and says, Jesus, the Messiah, baby born in a manger. That's the one that fulfills these prophecies. And I've been asking you every single week as we're looking at the names of God in this passage, how's God going to remove depression from your life? How's he going to remove darkness? How's he going to remove gloom of his people? How's he going to remove contempt from people living however they want out in the world, don't care to follow God, don't care what he says or his morality, they just want to live however they want to live. And as a result, they're an enemy of God. How's he going to remove that from people, from you, from me? In verse 2, how's he going to take us who are walking in darkness and show us the light? How's he going to take the world that's walking in darkness and pull us out? Because some of us are stuck in the world. We don't want to be living in darkness. We don't want to continue in that path. And yet, we feel like that's all we're surrounded by. So how does God pull us out of the darkness? How will God build his nation? How will he multiply his nation? Verse 3. How will he include, increase their gladness? How will you, God, break the yoke of the burden of your people? The burden, the weight the guilt, the shame. How's he going to break that for his people in Isaiah? How's he going to break it for you and me? Matthew comes along and says, the guy who's talking about in Isaiah, that's Jesus. That's the Messiah. He's the answer to breaking the yoke if you walk around and you feel burdened, if you walk around and you feel just heavy weight, if you walk around and you feel like, I'm never going to get out of this darkness. I don't know how. Matthew tells us he's the answer. Uh, This one, this We're finishing this series, and the last name is Prince of Peace. So we've looked at Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and we've looked at how those describe Jesus Christ. This this evening on Christmas Eve, Prince of Peace, Prince of Peace. Let me ask you this, uh, Christians, really quick, I need you to get vulnerable with me. Before you started chasing Jesus, what were you chasing after to find peace? Relationships. Somebody willing to be honest. Love, okay. Money, booze. I'm just trying to look generally so I don't look anybody in the eye. Come on, what were you chasing after? The world wants to know that Christians are real. The world wants to know that Christians are genuine. And the only way they get to see it is if they say, you were this way and now you're this way. What changed? What's different? Otherwise, why would I want to believe? 
Why would I want to follow Jesus? If it doesn't do anything in your life, if it's not going to help me at all, why would I bother doing what you do? It just seems like a bunch of rules and a waste of time. But if they can see that you used to follow, chase after booze, but you don't anymore, why? You used to just follow women around right and left, and every relationship just, just went worse and worse and worse. But now you don't. Why? What else? Finding Christ. Okay, status. What else did you chase for peace, thinking it would get you peace? Your way. Drugs, value, importance. Acceptance, good one. Money, power. Listen to, I didn't hear that one. It was a little kid, though, so I won't ask what it was. <laughs> Mom's like, no, no, shh, shh. <laughs> this is the value of family services. You never know what you're going to get. We all chased after something for peace. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the beauty of the good news. We chase and we chase and we chase and we chase looking for peace, and we come to a point in all of our lives where we realize what I was chasing after, thinking I was going to get peace, well, it, it hasn't come, and then I replaced it with something else, and that didn't bring it, and then I replaced it with something else, and that didn't bring it either. For me, it was relationships. I just need to find a good woman, be in a good relationship, and it'll go great. Life will go great. How many of you know marriage is not that easy? Anybody? <laughs> You're like, I thought this was going to be the answer. Who am I married to? Some people are raising their hands. I won't tell you who. Talker? Chased it lots of years, lots and lots and lots of years, thinking if I just got to the next step, it'll be fulfilling to me. If I just get the next success, it'll be fulfilling. If I just get the next recognition, it'll be fulfilling. If I'm just the best at this, it'll be fulfilling. And it never was. And it's no different than the person who goes to drugs, and it's no different than the person who goes to sex, and it's no different than the one who goes to fame or to money. or what. It's all the same. We're all chasing after peace. The question is, when are you going to back up and realize you won't find it in any of those things. The title is Prince of Peace. The word prince points to Jesus being the son of God. He's not the father. He's the prince. He's the prince of peace because he's the son. It points to him being the son of the father. Now, here's the important part in the book of Isaiah. Princes in Israel stunk. They were horrible. Over and over and over and over again, the reason why, part of the reason why judgment on the nation, judgment on the people of God, is because the princes were horrible. Isaiah chapter 3, the Lord judges the princes of Jerusalem and Judah because they're thieves. Isaiah chapter 19, the princes in Egypt, that's Gentile princes, they're fools, and they've led Egypt astray. Isaiah 23, the Lord takes, takes out the princes in Tyre because they're rebellious. Isaiah 31, the princes of Assyria, the ones who will come and destroy Israel, then it says one day they'll be terrified when the Lord God turns on them because they're corrupt. The princes of the nations will be nothing in Isaiah chapter 34. And in Isaiah chapter 49, every prince of the earth will bow to God. So for this prince to be described in a positive light is meaningful in the book because every other time you see princes in the book, it's always negative. But it's also always talking about men, not talking about God. The point is that Jesus is not flawed like all the other leadership that you experience in this world. He's not flawed like a president's, and I don't care who you vote for, they're flawed. He's not flawed like a dictator. He's not flawed like politicians. He's not flawed like whoever you elect. The point is, he's a prince, but he's a good leader, not flawed. For those of you who uh, want to, and kids, I'm going to have you come up in just a second. For those of you who, who just want a little nugget of theology, and I'll give it to you and just let you wrestle with it on your own. There's one other title of princes in the book of Isaiah. It's the princes of the sanctuary. And so all wrapped up in the title prince, not only do you have pointing to Jesus as a king, but you also have it pointing to him as a priest, a high priest, which is unbelievable in this book. You chew on that one. Kids, uh, kids, I'm going to read you a story. So if you want to read a story, uh, come on up here and sit right here on the steps, right here. If your parents want to come up with you and you want to sit with your kids because you don't think they'll sit, that's totally fine. But kids, come up. We're going to read a Christmas story real quick. Some kids are sleeping already. 
That's why we're getting them up out of their seats. Go, 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 go. Right there, right there on the steps. Facing this way. Right here, right here. In the middle. Come this way. Come this way. Come this way. In the middle so everybody can see you. Right here, right here, right here. Come quick. Come this way. Come this way. Come, my chair's over there. So I need you guys over here, over here, over here, over here. She's like, nope, I'm not going over there. Any more kids, if you want to come up, keep coming up. Parents, listen carefully to the story. Christmas is not hard to understand. Kids, listen, listen, listen. Can you say this after me? I'll say it, you repeat, and then I'll tell you when I'm going to keep reading and you don't have to repeat anymore. Louie's kid's going for the drums. <laughs> She's good. She's going to be good, too, because Daddy is good at the drums. <laughs> kids, repeat after me. Ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whoever believes believes in him him should not perish, perish. but have everlasting life. life. John 3.16. Okay, listen to the story. On the first Christmas, God gave his son Jesus to us. Jesus left heaven and came to earth so that we would not have to perish. To perish means to die Of course, our bodies will someday die, but if we believe in Jesus, our souls will live forever with God. Listen to the story. Christmas was just one week away. Missy and Bill memorized John 3.16 to say when their grandparents would come to visit. Each time Missy and Bill said John 3.16, they understood more about the meaning of Christmas, and they were thankful for God's Christmas gift to them. They were excited about celebrating Jesus' birthday. Just think, Missy said. God loves us so much that he gave Jesus as a gift to us so we can have everlasting life with him. Wait a minute, Bill said. It's Jesus' birthday. Why don't we give him a birthday gift? That's a great idea, Missy exclaimed. What can we give him? They thought and they thought, what could they give the Lord Jesus? At breakfast on Sunday morning, their dad said, let's pray for our choir. You will be singing praises to Jesus today. Your songs of praise are a special gift to God. That's cool, Missy said. We tried to think of a birthday present to give Jesus. When we sing today, I'm going to think of my songs having a big bow on them and a card saying happy birthday. After church, Missy and Bill saw Mr. Benson picking up bulletins and putting away hymn books in the pew racks. Can we help you, Mr. Benson? Asked Bill. Mr. Benson smiled at them. You are an answer to prayer. Your time is a special gift you can give to Jesus. Missy and Bill looked at each other. And grinned. Do you mean that helping you is a gift to Jesus? Asked Missy. Wow, Bill exclaimed. Our songs of praise and our times are gifts we can give to Jesus. Thank you for letting us help you, Mr. Benson. John 3.16 teaches us that God loves us so much that he gave a special gift. Kids, what's the gift? Jesus. Is that right? Eternal life? That's the answer to the next question. I haven't even read it yet. Reagan, you're super smart. All right, the book says we're supposed to say John 3, 16 three times. Ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Ready? Time number two. For God so loved the world That he gave gave his only begotten son, son. that whoever believes in him him should not perish, perish. but have everlasting life. Should we make the parents do it with us this time? Everybody together? All right, ready. Everybody together. For God so loved the world world, that he gave gave his only begotten son, son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16. You want a candy cane before you go back to your seat? Yes, yes. 
All I got is candy canes. Okay, go back and find your parents. Uh, thank you. Da, 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 da. She's like, woohoo. Nice job. <laughs> Don't forget it. You almost forgot it. Nice job. You should have a candle. Your kids should have a little tea light for when we sing Silent Night. So if you didn't get one of those or your kids didn't get a little tea light on their way in, you may want to go out into the lobby or in the little kind of foyer in between the lobby and in here and grab one of those so we can, for a time when we sing. Prince, Jesus Christ, peace is the second. Like I said, you never know what you're going to get. It's amazing. Most people, when they think of peace, they think worldly, a temporary absence of conflict. If Israel and Hamas just call ceasefire, that's peace, right? If Russia and Ukraine just call ceasefire, that's peace, right? If America doesn't go to war with anybody, then we're at peace with the world, right? A temporary absence of conflict. That's a low bar for peace. We'll watch this video real quick. Here's what the Bible describes as peace. It's got nothing to do with a temporary absence of conflict. It's actually far more than that. Watch the video real quick. The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting. It also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate, and it rarely happened. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom. And his reign would bring shalom with no end. A time when God would make a covenant of shalom with his people and make right all wrongs and heal all that's been broken. This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others. Like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the Apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven and on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection.
So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or in our world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. Let me ask you, when you think about the things you chased after searching for peace, maybe it's status, maybe it's money, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's love, maybe it's success, isn't it true that we were all searching for wholeness? That's what we were really looking for. That's what we've always been really looking for. Not just temporary absence of conflict. I don't, I don't want to just have a temporary absence of conflict with my wife. I'd like it for it to be good. <laughs> it's not peace. There's something more that the scriptures offer, that the Bible offers. The word is wholeness. He's the prince of wholeness, the prince of peace, or the son of wholeness. You get this, that in order to be Jesus, to be prince of a kingdom, he has to be, if he's going to be the prince of peace, he not only himself has to be at peace or whole, but he also has to have a kingdom full of people who are whole, who are at peace. See, it's not just that he himself is the prince of peace, he himself is wholeness or God, it's that he rules a people who are whole, made right, fixed from being broken, put back together, fix the missing pieces. Because he's not just peace himself, he's the prince, the ruler of a kingdom that's full of peace, ruler of a people that are made whole. So the peace that Jesus Christ offers you is not just the absence of conflict. The peace that he's offering you this Christmas, Easter, today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the peace that he's offering is wholeness. It's satisfaction. It's rest. It's putting back together what's been broken. It's fixing what you've tried and tried and tried and tried and tried, and doesn't matter how hard you try, you just get to a point and you say, I can't fix it. I can't fix the brokenness that comes with the loss of a loved one. I can't fix the brokenness of the domino effects of what I've done in my life. I can't fix the ruin and the wreck of everything that I've done to everybody else. I can't fix what's been broken in me because of someone else's sin. I can't fix it, no matter how hard I try. That's the wholeness that Christ is offering. That's the peace that Jesus Christ is offering. It's peace to a guy named Abraham who he made a promise to. I'll bless all the nations of the world through you. It's peace to a guy named David whom he said, I'll sit someone on your throne everlasting forever. It's peace to the shepherds whom were announced that the Messiah, King of the Jews, has come. It's heavenly peace. It's not just earthly peace. It's eternal. It's everlasting. It's life-giving peace. Until Jesus returns, there will not be the absence of conflict in this life. Only in heaven will you find the absence of conflict. What you will find in this life is peace from within. When you submit to Jesus Christ, when you say, that's what I've been looking for, that's what I've been missing, that's where I got off track, that's what I always never knew I was searching for, but I kept searching for it in a million other things, and you say, Jesus, that's the peace I want. That's the one he offers in this life. And don't worry, the next life, peace in heaven and earth. New heavens and new earth, it will come to pass. I want to pray. I want to give you a chance to pray to God and ask for his peace, and then... Uh, the band's going to come up, we're going to sing another song, and we're going to take an offering during the song. Now, our offering that we take on Christmas Eve goes to help families who are in need. I said earlier at the 11 o'clock service uh, this morning, our goal was to help 15 families around Christmas time this year, and we're at 18 so far. And we still have this evening. So we take an offering during the Christmas Eve services and we use it to help families in need uh, across our church and sometimes out in the community and a meaningful gift, not just uh, uh, here's a Christmas present for your kids, a, a meaningful, sizable gift that we're able to help 
used to help families. Now, some of you may not have come to church uh, this Sunday, may not have been able to give your normal tithes and offerings. If you want to do that and give to the general fund of our church as kind of a year-end gift, would you put it in an envelope and designate it general fund, okay? Because if money just comes into this offering, we'll take it and we'll use it for families uh, in our church and in our community. That's what this offering goes for primarily. But if you want to give to the general fund because you're a regular goer here and this is your Sunday service, then please do that. Just put it in an envelope and designate it that way. Um, We're going to take our offering during the next song, uh, but for now, bow your heads with me. Ushers, you can come down front. If you've never said, Jesus, I need forgiveness, if, you've, if you're listening to what peace really means in the Bible and you're thinking about millions of people all over the world celebrate Jesus Christ, there's no man more attested in all of history. There's no miraculous event more well documented than the resurrection of Jesus Christ of all of ancient history, the resurrection. And if you're thinking, I've been searching, 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 searching for peace, but really I've just been chasing temporary things, you can say to Jesus Christ tonight, I want a peace that lasts eternal. I want a peace that I've been searching for, that I thought I knew where I would find it, but really I've been looking in the wrong places. So if you've never said I believe in Jesus, if you've never committed to him, if you've never said I want to follow you and I need you to be my savior, you can do that right now. I want you to pray this with me. You'd say, God, I need peace in my life. And I'm sorry that I've looked everywhere else for peace except to Jesus Christ. But today, tonight, this Christmas Eve, I want to start looking to Jesus for peace. Peace in my marriage. Peace in my security. Peace in my mind. Peace in my heart. I want to stop looking for it everywhere in the world that won't satisfy me. God, forgive me. I should have been looking to you all along. God, I need your peace. I need your rest. In Jesus' name, amen.